It's my honor to welcome to the stage our special guest this evening, the architect of Paris, uh, someone I think all of us in this room know how much we owe her. Many millions of others do not know how much they owe her, but really everyone does owe her for the work that she did at Paris, before Paris and since Paris. Please welcome Christiana Figueres, former Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Christiana. <laughs> Well, good evening to all of you. Does everybody have a knot in their throat? Because this has been such an emotional evening. How absolutely beautiful, how inspiring. Honestly, it's, um, it's very difficult to sit here and listen to these stories and not be completely um, overcome with um, the beauty that the world is actually bringing forward. So thank you very, very much. And Sarah. I would like to actually start by thanking you. Because do you know that Sarah had this vision that everyone in the world needs and deserves energy? Not five years ago, not 10 years ago, way back in the 1990s. I'll have you know that was last century. <laughs> and Sarah, the vision that you had and the commitment that you have brought to that, because let's be very frank, Sarah could perfectly well have spent her life uh, sitting on a beautiful Costa Rican beach, I come from Costa Rica, enjoying uh, the beauty of nature and not doing anything for humankind. And she chose differently. She chose to devote her life, her energy, her enthusiasm uh, to truly making a difference to humanity. So, You know, it's not very often that someone inspires the creation of a new word. Uh, Sarah inspired the creation of the word philanthrocapitalism, uh, which I think is a fantastic word to bring uh, into one term the vision that Sarah had that while giving grants to all of these fantastic projects was a good idea, perhaps moving it over into the award space uh, that gets much more publicity, much more exposure, much more public attention, is better for those, uh, for those enterprises and those initiatives because it allows them then to access more public support in the countries in which they work and certainly to access the kind of financing that they need from the private sector in order to go to scale. So philanthrocapitalism uh, is uh, the word that I think so much encapsulates the Ashton Awards and, uh, and we're truly grateful to Sarah and to all of your team because I know that teams work very, very hard behind the scenes and I am grateful also to your full team. Um, and to the winners tonight. Uh, not only have you brought me to tears, um, honestly, to see what is being done from transport, uh, which is an incredibly exciting sector that is undergoing the largest revolution since the invention of the internal combustion engine. Tonight, I decided, right, we are all going to go all going to go to the inauguration of the museum to the internal combustion engine, because we will all see that. <laughs> uh, so very, very exciting what we're seeing in the transport side. Uh, on the buildings side, uh, how exciting is it that we are now able to both retrofit properly, uh, as well as be uh, much more responsible about the new buildings uh, that we are putting in around the world, especially considering that 60% of the infrastructure that we're gonna need to uh, welcome all of the rest of brothers and sisters who will be joining us on this planet, 60% of that infrastructure hasn't even been built. So to go in with a much better design and be mindful from 
the from the from the start about how we build that, uh, how exciting. And then in the power side, uh, all of these fantastic uh, initiatives to optimize the grid, um, to new ways to store energy, to buy energy, to pay for energy. I mean, absolutely fantastic. Truly, each one very, very inspirational. I came to the conclusion, actually, to all of you winners, that each of you is a little concentrated cube of the SDGs. Because not only are you working on one SDG, you're actually working across so many, from women's empowerment, to health, to better cities, uh, to, to better uh, transport. Uh, fantastic how each of you, through the enterprises and the initiatives that you have chosen and that you have devoted your lives to, you are really showing that all of these SDGs truly are linked. So in my book, you will remain little concentrated cubes of SDGs, and I thank you for that. Um, I also was struck by, uh, by these examples that um, basically what you are showing the world uh, is you are showing that there are at least three barriers that we used to think were barriers. Uh, now from the climate uh, perspective, and you're truly breaking through those now understood as mythical barriers. The three barriers that I think you are demonstrating that just no longer exist. The first is, uh, do you remember the days in which people used to say, there's no solution to climate change, you know? There's just is nothing that we're going to do about it. It's too complicated. It's too expensive. Uh, I love this is my this is my favorite one. It's too late anyway, so we can't do anything about it. Uh, do you remember those days? Well, thanks to you and to many other people around the world, those days are gone. That was a mythical barrier. Yes, we do have innovation. Yes, we do have solutions. And they are here uh, to be used and to, scale, to be scaled up. So all the way from the UK to India, from Rwanda, Nigeria, Kenya, to so many other African countries, what a fantastic array of innovation and of solutions that you have brought here for us, showing that it is possible to use financial technology, hard technology, as well as soft social uh, technology to address climate change in a timely fashion. So to me, the conclusion that I reached from that is that maybe the carbon constraint has actually been the impetus for a huge amount of uh, innovation that we are just starting to see and will continue to see. So hooray for constraints. Uh, they are not barriers, they're actually impetus for, uh, for moving forward and being able to break through. The second mythical barrier that I think uh, you all are showing is that addressing climate change is not only a moral issue. Yes, it is also a moral issue, and many of these projects have spoken to that. But it is not only a moral issue. Thank heavens, when we address climate change, we're actually looking at a stacking of imperatives. To me, the fundamental imperative is always morality. Always. How is it possible that we have done this to the next generation? How is it possible that we have 1.3 billion people without energy? On and on and on. The list of moral issues is vast and long. But that's only one imperative. Yes, we have to do that. Then on top of that, all of you are showing that there is a technological imperative because you are developing the technologies that uh, can actually answer that. On top of that, we have the financial imperative because you know that capital is beginning, including through the Ashton Awards, capital is beginning to shift from the dirty technologies to the clean technologies and is beginning to shift at scale, which is exactly where we have to be. And then we have, finally, the policy technology, because the kinds of innovations that you put forward are actually attracting the attention of those who are making the policy, and we're beginning to see policy shifts. So once you have those stackings, then you really understand that this is an 
Is it a no-brainer or a non-brainer? I keep on getting corrected about that in any event. How blessed are we that we are all alive in the moment and the evolution of humankind when we can do the moral and right thing, the financially profitable thing, the technologically advanced thing, and be able to put them all together into coherent packages that are actually addressing climate change. That is a privilege, my friends. Our parents, my parents, did not have that privilege. They didn't have those tools at hand. We do. And that is a privilege that we have right now, those of us who are alive right now. And with every privilege, as we know, comes a responsibility to be able to use uh, all of those tools and instruments in a very intentional way. The third the mythical barrier that you're helping to punch through, do you remember when climate change was all about doom and gloom? It was all about the tragedy of the commons. Well. Yes, to a certain extent, it still is the tragedy of the commons, but I think what we have seen today is that it's actually the opportunity of the locals. Because what have we seen? All of these projects, there's nothing top down about this. It's all bottom up. It's all solutions that speak to the very, very conditions in the areas in which they are, in the client base in which they're operating. How fantastic is it to be able to understand what the needs and the interests are, where you are working, and be able to respond to those. And very much, if I may say so, very much in the spirit of the Paris Agreement, that was also not a top down, but rather a bottom up everyone bringing their contribution to the table and underlining the fact that all of these incentives and all of these technologies and these policies actually need to be aligned across all levels. So all the way from the local to the subnational, to the city, to the state, um, and to the federal government, with one exception. Um, <laughs> but the alignment definitely helps in most countries. Um, so thank you to all the winners for those three lessons and for punching through uh, three mythical barriers uh, and to all the rest of you, in fact, to everyone, including the winners. I derive the conclusion that we're all fantastic, stubborn optimists. So what do I mean by that? When I talk about optimism and I call myself an optimist, uh, I don't talk about that kind of optimism that comes from reaching the goal or achieving what you wanted to achieve and then sitting down and applauding. Honestly, that's actually pretty simple optimism. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the optimism that is not the destination, but the start of the journey. And that is where all of you are. All of you know that there is not a single achievement in the history of humankind that has been won if it started with defeatism, if it started with pessimism. It just doesn't work. It is only if we engage in these fantastic journeys that we're in, whether it be at the very local level or whether it be the global level and everything in between, it is only if we start already with optimism and we inject the entire process with that confidence and with that trust and with the radical collaboration that comes with it that we can actually move forward. And why do I call it stubborn? Well, not only because my family classified me as being stubborn when I was three years old and stood in front of my father's croquet ball for reasons completely unknown to everybody else, but very clear to me, I just thought it would be fun. But here's what I have learned since I was three years old, that actually it's very, very good to be stubborn as long as it's for the common good. And optimism should not be naive, we should certainly understand that there are always going to be challenges that we are confronting, but we have to continue to be stubbornly optimistic and know that no matter what the challenge is in front of us, and these winners today are celebrating a high moment, I guarantee within 24 hours or seven days, they will hit a challenge because we all do. And that is the moment in which we have to become very stubborn and understand, yes, okay, here's a challenge, here's a barrier, here's a problem. That is not gonna stop us. 
We're gonna figure out some way around. And all of these winners have already figured uh, the way around many of the challenges that they have been facing and they will continue to do so and so will all of you. Because this is it, my friends. This is it. Climate change is absolutely the most challenging and deeply revolutionizing uh, challenge that mankind has ever faced. We are going to address it. We're going to address it, in fact, even in a timely fashion, with the help of all of these fantastic people and many outside this, uh, this hall. But we're not going to do so unless all of us join uh, in a very powerful family of stubborn optimists to which I invite you all. Thank you. <laughs>